Hello and welcome back to another episode of Pizza and Property. My name is Todd Sloan and today we're going to be talking to five incredibly successful investors around Australia to find out what would they buy, where would they buy and why would they buy it. They've got a budget of $700,000 as an absolute maximum and each one of these investors, whilst they've all built very respectable portfolios, in some cases, astonishingly huge portfolios, they all look at things slightly differently, which is exactly why we make these episodes. Because if you're looking at buying an investment property, one thing that we're very big on at Pizza and Property is it's not about finding the one way, it's about finding the right way for you and your situation. So on the episode today, our lineup, we've got Lachlan Vidler, Maddie Schrama, Pharrell Rafoum, Steve McKnight, and Kate Bacos, all answering the questions, what would you buy? Where would you buy it? And why would you buy it? But right now, let's jump into the episode and talk with Lachlan Vidler to find out what, where, and why. Lachlan Vidler, how you going, mate? Todd, good, mate. How you doing? Hey, good, good. I was about to say, like, long-time listener, first-time caller. You and I have been chatting for a little while, but I think this is the first time on the show. It absolutely is, mate. Definitely a long-time listener and first-time caller. That's a good description. Well, it's a good time. A good time. It's good to have you on the show and good to start <laughs> pulling apart your take on where the hotspot is to potentially buy for under $700,000. And I think your first cab off the rank with this one as well, man. So being a, a panel episode and having to squeeze so much in, do you mind if we jump straight into the first question of what would you buy? Absolutely, mate. Well, so for us um, at, at Atlas Property Group, we really focus on the whole portfolio building approach. So at different stages of your journey, you're going to need different things. And today I'm just going to focus on what we do in the early or foundational stage. And I okay. think, if, especially for that sort of price point, mm -hmm. we're definitely going to be looking for a house and we're definitely going to be looking for something that's got some land attached, um, as you would expect with a house. Mm -hmm. And for that property, uh, personally, I think simple is best. If it's an exciting investment, in, especially in property, it's maybe not the best thing because uh, usually that means extra risk. Mm -hmm. So we're probably looking for a very standard, you know, brick home, unexciting, uninteresting, but it's going to be a good long-term performing investment. And when you say some land attached, are we talking like what, four, 500 square meters? Or are you talking more like a, no, we want 800 to 1,000 square meters land attached? Yeah, well, look, I think probably 800 to 1,000 would be ideal, right? It doesn't need to be that. I probably, I definitely wouldn't be doing 300. I wouldn't really be doing 400 either. I'd probably set a minimum around six, more so because you're probably, you're not likely to be able to, you know, say subdivide that, for example. Yeah. But it's good land. It's uh, It means that your tenant is going to be happy. You're going to attract probably a wider pool of people. And at the end of the day, we don't know what councils are going to do in the future. And who knows, maybe in the, in that, in that future, a 600 square meter uh, bit of land, you can do a granny flat or maybe a, a very small subdivision. Not that I would want to live in one of them. <laughs> okay. so, so basically you got a little bit up your sleeve for, for later, even if it's not for now, you never know. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. Man. And whereabouts would you be buying it? So, I mean, this is always the hot topic, isn't it? Where do we go? Are we going to give secrets away? Are we going to do something else? And for me, I'm just going to come out and say it, you know, where we, we really like Toowoomba. I think Toowoomba is a fantastic market to be in, especially for this price point. I think uh, for those people who don't know where Toowoomba is, uh, it's about sort of, you know, an hour and a half uh, to two hours west of Brisbane, maybe about an hour west of Ipswich, if you want to separate the two out. But uh, it's a fantastic place that you can go to where you're going to be able to get good pricing on properties, good rental returns, uh, and it's very co-located to a capital city, which I think can be a major attribute for a, for a location. And so 700 grand in Toowoomba, what, what are you getting these days? Because yeah. that used to be able to get your few houses in Toowoomba. Absolutely, mate. Well, look, I guess there's a few ways to sort of cut this up. You know, what you could do firstly is you could look to buy something anywhere from maybe five to 600, mm -hmm. leave a little bit in the kitty and just go simple, right? Nothing crazy, jump in, buy something, set and forget, start to build out the basics of your portfolio. Or you could push the envelope, you could go up to maybe, you know, 600, 650, and you could take some of that gap to the 700 and do a bit of a, a bit of a cosmetic reno on the property. And that's going to A, increase your cash flow, or B, increase your val the value, the capital growth on gotcha. the property. Do you want me to tell you why I like Toowoomba so much? Yeah, yeah, moment, man. I was actually just about to ask, um, what, what kind of a, yeah. a yield would you be looking at? And why do you actually even want to invest in Toowoomba? Yeah, well, I think for me, like I said before, one big key part is I like its co-location of Brisbane because you do get a lot of people that will travel between the two or maybe do weekends there, especially if they've got family yep. and especially because of how close Ipswich is. So location-wise, big tick. It's got an airport. Now, I'm a big believer that I'm not the smartest person in the room and the people who go and look at things like airports, especially airports that have a lot of traffic, there's big reasons for that because they're expensive things to build and expensive mm. things to, to uh, maintain. So Toowoomba not only has an airport there, 
they've actually got a second runway that's then, oh, sorry, it's a second airport. It's not really a second runway um, that they use for, I guess, more private type flights and, and flight training, things like that. So I really like that aspect of it. But then when we dive into the numbers, Toowoomba's had a lot of good performance, but even to today, right, we're looking at inventory levels on average across the region of less than two months, which is very tight. We've got vacancies at around that 1% mark, which again, very tight. And, and, and I mean, I'm sure some areas there's basically no vacancy. Mm -hmm. Yields, I'd say anywhere from about four and a half to maybe five, depending on how you, you know, if you can negotiate a really good deal there. Yep. And then finally for me, Days on market. I mean, great indicator of demand in the area. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know, when we're looking at supply and demand, we look at inventory. Days on market. We're talking teens, teens, yeah, right. teens to low twenties, which is just so tight. And for me, I joke about it with my team all the time. You know, that can be a rounding error. You know, right? does the agent put it up a bit later, and it could have been nine days on market, but now it's fourteen. You know, things like that. So it's um, it's so tight, so so tight, and that's a key aspect of. Uh, property growth. Mate, I love it. Okay, so what we're buying is a brick home, minimum 600 square meters, making sure you've got a good set of land, a good good amount of land and something that's not too crazy, but maybe you could add a little bit of value to. You're buying it in Toowoomba, around a 5% yield, 17 days on market. So we're looking like a very tightly held location. I'm assuming this is going to be pretty hard to get into, but if you can, potentially going to do really well. And as far as the why, there's some large investment going on in the area. Like you said, if you, you feel that you're not the smartest person in the room, you want to be surrounding yourself with others that are putting their money where their mouth is. And if you're building an airport, someone's certainly doing that in a big way. And as far as the proximity to Brizzy as well, whilst it's not a next door neighbor, it's still close enough for a commute. Is there anything I've missed out in a bit of a wrap up there, mate? No, I think that's a great wrap up. I think uh, I'm a big fan of the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And I think we <laughs> kept it pretty simple there. Love it. Lachlan Vidler from Atlas Property. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Todd. All right, so we're looking at Toowoomba, 600 square meter minimum, brick house. And by the sounds of things, you're still getting a bit of change for this, or potentially, which could mean that you've got some room to add value, like Lachlan's saying. So if renovation's actually in your timeline, or not timeline, but you know, if, if that's if that's the strategy that you're wanting to implement, maybe Toowoomba's the place to look into. But maybe the regional side of things doesn't quite sit with you. As much as there's a lot of money to be made in regional markets, maybe you're the kind of investor that actually wants things to be that touch more blue chip. So right now, we're going to be talking with Maddie Schrama from Schrama Property Group to find out what would he buy, where would he buy, and why would he buy it? Because I'm pretty sure he's going to go a little bit blue chip. Matty Shrama, it's been too long, man. How you going? Good, Toddy. How are you? Yeah, always good, mate. I know things are pumping behind you guys at the moment. You've just been uh, nominated for an award recently. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, mate. Really humbled, obviously. Got nominated for Buyer's Agency of the Year at the REIQ Awards, the Real Estate Institute of Queensland, and also uh, myself personally, Buyer's Agent of the Year. So really humbled and um, at another awards, we also got nominated Gold Coast Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Mate, scoring tries on and off the field. But um, <laughs> <laughs> well, if we could jump into to the episode of the day then, man, I think there's a lot of people gonna that, that, that are going to want your thoughts on this one. You got 700K to spend. It's burning a hole in your back pocket. Well, I should say invest rather than spend. What would you buy? Yeah. Where would you buy? Why would you buy it? Let's kick it off with what would you buy first, man? Love it, mate. Well, what would I buy? Again, I, I'm always a big believer in uh, location does 80% of the heavy lifting. So if I was to go maybe location first, mate, mm -hmm. so if I had 700 a mate, looking at the Gold Coast, what that could get you is a lot of different types of assets, but I'd be focusing in on low density unit within a 200 meter radius of the sand south of Broadbeach north of cool and gutter south of broad beach north of okay so we've jumped a little bit into where but before actually I, I drill down on that so i noticed you didn't say from the water from the sand so we're talking totally different ball game yeah. when we're we're talking like uh in like the mermaid waters versus the beach is that why you said from the sand 100 percent, yeah so gold coast is really strong uh at the moment in terms of capital growth but yep. there's a little bit of a sweet spot in the sub million market because we're below 1% vacancy rate. I think it's sitting at around 0 0.7, 0 0.6. The yield is actually still super strong. But what I'm noticing, the true value is obviously in the dirt. And a lot of the amenities, growth, transport hubs, the school catchment zones, mm -hmm. a lot of it is in those suburbs that are very close proximity to, to the sand, where, aka the beach. And, and so they're kind of your blue chip 
um, locations for the Gold Coast. And just to quickly jump in as well, for anyone that's maybe a little bit newer and doesn't understand the scarcity factor, you said low density. Could you expand a little bit on why? 100%. I think low density is a, a nearly non-negotiable. And the reason is you really want to, I always put it this way, a house is 100% land to asset ratio. Mm -hmm. A duplex will be, say, 50% land to asset ratio. And then for 700K, unfortunately, you can't get either of those two in blue chip locations. So considering that the location's locked and we're not going to be non-negotiable there, because if we go back to what I said at the start, location will do 80% of the lifting. If that's a non-negotiable pillar, we've got to work backwards from there. So what I'm looking for, low density is... How many, if we consider a, a block of land, how much ownership of that land can we have while still being at around 700K? Gotcha. So with that on the Gold Coast in the blue chip areas, you're looking at, I'd say blocks of eight or under. And okay. the reason I call that low density is it's scarce. It's, a scarce, it's not a high tr transactional block of land. So you're not a one in 100th owner mm -hmm. of that block of land you're a one in potentially eight or six owner of that block of land. And that, and the value is in the land, not so much the, the dwelling itself. Gotcha. Okay. And why, so this was south of Broad Beach, north of Coolangatta. Is that what you said, if I've got you correct? Yeah. And, and the reason now on a, on a deeper level, suburb wise is the huge trends at the moment, migration wise, oh. are all leaning towards what we call the Southern Gold Coast. Okay, And that's a little bit of a hot tip for anyone out there. The migration from not only interstate migration, but internally as well in terms of just up the road in Brisbane has been massive for Southern Gold Coast. So working as a buyer's agent on the Gold Coast, mm -hmm. suburbs always on the list are those, you know, Mermaids, Burleys, Palm Beach, Currumbin, that Southern pocket. Mm -hmm. They're on everyone's hot list. Um, and it's not just locals now that know about it. It is spreading towards, as I said, Sydney buyers, Melbourne buyers, Brisbane buyers, overseas buyers as well. Uh, but the, this is the big one, Todd, I, I find land is extremely scarce. The reason I love the Gold Coast is if you think of where the ocean is, you cannot build a new land estate east mm -hmm. of the Gold Coast. There, there's no land available. You no. cannot build on the water. And then to the west, it's actually, there's a hinterland. Yeah, It's called the Gold Coast hinterland. So we've, we're actually a very landlocked city that's having huge amounts of internal migration into this landlocked area. So it's causing this, this effect of like, um, yeah, extreme price growth and rental demand. So that's why I'm always saying, try and get into the, the land asset. So don't focus on so much the um the shiny house or the brand new development or the the high-rise building go for the land uh, try and own for 700k try and find as much land asset ratio as you can within close proximity to that to that beach and because it's so like it's, it's kind of similar to adelaide in that sense but i think minus a bit of perfect weather and a few bikinis really yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and this is what i'm liking this is why i consider it strong investing because a lot of the migration isn't investor money. It's it's owner occupiers mm. wanting to change their lifestyle and live here. So I don't know about you, but I'm really big on, on finding areas that are driven by owner occupier growth. Mm -hmm. As an investor, you want to tap into those suburbs because they're the ones that are more house proud. They're the ones that the street appeals better. They're the ones that look after the place more. And it's probably the big one. They're the ones who get emotional and don't pay investor prices. They pay owner occupier. That price emotional is, price kicks in. Emotional price, exactly. Yeah. So if you can attach yourself in there as an investor, what you'll see is surrounding it is people moving there and paying beyond top dollar because their son wants to go into a certain school because the weather in Melbourne, they've had enough and now they're like, this is more important to our family. They want the lifestyle change that now COVID has allowed them to work from home and they can live in a good destination but still have their corporate job in Sydney. Gotcha. So what I'm finding is those kind of characteristics are worth more than kind of the investor play. They're, they're not looking at it from an investor's eye. They're looking at it from family, lifestyle, what's important to them. So 
so that's what I'm noticing is pushing up the prices. So summarizing summarizing what you've said here, Maddie, we've got low density units, 200 meters from the the sand, not from the water, from the sand, and we're looking basically in between Broad Beach and Coolangatta. And as far as the wise concern, emotional buyers, you're wanting people to absolutely fall in love and really push these prices up. Pretty much, yeah. And and just a little micro tip on that is really try and find something that you can manufacture your own equity. So the reason I love low density, mm -hmm. a lot of those lower density ones, eight or under, are actually very old. Yeah. They're brick walk. They don't have pools. They don't have lifts. They don't have tennis courts or barbecue areas. They're as basic as it gets. I don't like units so much because of body corporate, mm -hmm. but a lot of those ones are very low body corporate per week. And a lot of them are very simple floor plans to work with for a cosmetic. You don't really need to knock out walls. It's a simple case, paint, carpet, blinds, fans, mm -hmm. and then maybe a two-pack kitchen from Bunnings and you can rent them out at top dollar. Love it. Matty Schrammer from Schrammer Property Group. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. There's a couple of nuggets of gold in here and I'm sure we'll have you back on again soon. Legend, Todd. Thanks for having me. I got to say, at first I was a little bit surprised that Matt's talking about units. But then I realized like, wait a second, I've given everyone a, a, like a maximum of 700K. So I guess there's, there's only so far that it can stretch in certain markets. But then when he starts talking about more like this, this scarcity factor, no more than eight in a pack, ideally the, the less the better. And unpacking the land to, to asset ratio, this totally makes sense. So if you're still wanting to get into maybe more of a blue chip area, what was he saying again? Is it between, between Brody and, and Cool and Gatta and 200 meters from the sand? That was the thing that really stuck out to me as well. But now it's time to get a whole new perspective from Pharrell Rufio, a property investor that's got a very strong data focus to find out what would he buy, where would he buy, and why would he buy it? Okay, Pharrell, how you going, mate? Hey, Todd, how are you? Mate, very good. It's good to have you on the show. I'm, yeah, uh, thank you for thank you for having me. Well, mate, I'm looking forward to to hearing your pick because with your background as a senior research analyst, I, I'm kind of thinking there's going to be a few cogs turning and a few people very interested to hear what you've got to say. So, because we're in a tight time frame, do you mind if we jump into the what before the where? Yeah, sure. Let's get into it. All right. Uh, what would you buy? Yeah, sure. Um, look, with 700 grand, look, I would focus on buying a house with a big block of land. Okay. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, land always goes up in value um, over time if you look at the stats uh, and uh, land is becoming very scarce. So buying a house with a big block of land is my strategy where um, I would actually use that to actually utilize to build a granny flat at the back and uh, basically um, increase my cash flow. And what's a big block of land? Big blocks, 600, 800, 1,000? Look, look in Brisbane, you can definitely get something for around the 700, 750 mm -hmm. uh, square meters within that 30K radius um, of Brisbane CBD. Okay. All right. So you're looking for a house, big block of land with granny flat potential around that kind of 700 square meter mark. As far as brick, weatherboard, Queenslander, any preference there? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say brick um, would be good. Um, look, um, well, at the end of the day, it's all about uh, manufacturing equity by doing some renovations, the property buying at below market value, mm -hmm. and basically just um, trying to get in the market with a low entry point. Okay. And as far as the where's concerned, you've already sort of name dropped Brisbane there. Is that just a, a bit of a general reference or are we looking around Brizzy? Yeah, around Brisbane. Look, um, I was advised to stay within the um, 20, 20K radius, but with a with a with a budget of seven hundred k, I'd say you can get something for five hundred to five hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars within the outer ring of Brisbane. Also within the Logan corridor as well, you can get something within five hundred and fifty grand. Five fifty. You still have hundred. Yeah, hundred percent. How, how outer are we talking there? Like we're talking like almost the the cusp of Logan meets Brisbane, or? Yes, I'd, I'd say just around there, um, closer to the M1 highway. Yep. You can definitely get some good pockets of uh, of Logan. Uh, with uh, big blocks of land and uh, you can basically do a bit of renovations to the properties as well um, good frontage as well around the 20 meter frontage so we you have side access to put a granny flat at the back okay so basically where brisbane meets logan around there but we're over the brisbane side of the the border you're making sure that you've got everything set up for, for a granny flat so it's all there around the 550,000 mark so there's still there's change left over and i suppose that change 100 is to build the granny flat that that's exactly i mean gotcha. look you can get something for, i'd say with 500 would be something that completely needs a lot of work so you basically spend 50 grand on doing a bit of renovations and touch-ups and that basically increases the value of the property mm -hmm. and as you do your refinancing um it depends which bank you go with they'll give you a bit of you know capital as well to be at the granny flat in the future and what are you looking at for a granny these days 
a granny at, i'd say 200k you can get a nice two or three bedroom granny flat and you can get very good rent out of that i'd say 400 dollars per week in rent mm -hmm. and there's, there's your double cash flow from the front of the house and also the granny flat and plus you also get capital growth from the land as well so you're going for a capital growth cash flow play mixture of development and uh, or small scale development being a granny and a bit of reno as well so some some sweat equity to force it up 100 percent. you basically you just like get the equity out and you basically rinse and repeat Love it, man. And uh, capping it all off, why why a 700 square meter house with granny flat potential and Renault potential around the Brisbane Logan border? What's the why? Look, I'm a big uh, advocate of Brisbane. As you know, we have the Olympics coming up. But if we put Olympics on the side, we do get a very good um, interstate migration here in Brisbane. A lot of people coming from Sydney and Melbourne because of our weather and also affordability. And lots of infrastructure projects are being uh, um, carried out by the government especially the extended planes of the M1 highway. We have Brisbane Metro coming, Cross River Rail. Um, the second Brisbane airport is already under, underway. And um, a lot of activities happening in Brisbane and um, a lot of people seeing opportunity here. So buying within that 20, 30K radius within that budget, um, I think uh, it's a it's a long-term play for investors. Okay, so affordability, there's opportunity and we're looking at a lot of infrastructure. Is that a, a fair summation of the one? Exactly, warm? exactly. That is literally the recipe of capital growth. Um, also employment opportunities, you know, for your tenants as well. Living in that Logan area, you've got the Logan Hospital. You have the M1 highway that takes you straight to Brisbane City as well. Brisbane City is one of the biggest employment hubs, as you know, and you're also in the middle of Brisbane and Gold Coast as well, which is another big city down south. Awesome. Pharrell Rafu, thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for having me. I gotta say, I actually wasn't expecting that from Pharrell, but so around the 550 mark and still having enough left over to maybe do a bit of a reno, pull out some equity. And it's, it really sounds like it's, it's this perfect little balance between what he believes is going to be a cash flow play and a capital growth play. Some pretty decent proximity to Brizzy as well. So if you're keen on getting your hands dirty or outsourcing it, or maybe even getting into a little bit of light developing with building a granny flat, maybe this could be one to check out for you. Thanks again for jumping on the show, Pharrell. But for right now, we want to chat with one of the, I, I want to say the godfathers of property investing, but uh, I, I don't think that really conjures up the right, right image as far as um, I can't ever see Steve having a baseball bat at dinner, <laughs> but we're going to be talking with the one and only best-selling author, now property investing fund manager, Mr. Steve McKnight, to find out what would he buy, where would he buy it, and why would he buy it? Steve McKnight, it's been too long, mate. How you going? Hey, Todd. It's nice to be back. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. And, and I think that you're going to offer an opinion that's potentially going to be maybe a little bit, uh, how do I say it, contradictory to others. I, one of the things I, I love about you, Steve, is you're never afraid to march the beat of your own drum. And I think that showing a full perspective of how people can really win in property investing is one of the things we love to pride ourselves on at Pizza and Property. And I think when it comes to winning in property investing, you you certainly hold that accolade, accolade high, in my opinion. So if we can jump into the first question, Steve, we've got what, where, and why. What would you buy? What would I buy? Yeah. Well, having just raised $60 million in a fund that I'm getting going, I'm looking at purchasing positive cash flow commercial property in Australia. But that's different to what I've bought in the past, which has been positive cash flow commercial property in the United States and positive cash flow properties in New Zealand and Australia. I am very different in the way that I approach investing, Todd, because instead of trying to buy good assets, I try and buy good outcomes. And by saying that, what it means is the outcome that I'm looking for predicates the asset that I buy rather than the asset that I buy predicating the outcome that I hope for. So one of the things that I've done over the last 20 years as a professional property investor is try and leave less things to chance and more things to choice. Okay, so you're not buying a what as far as a, I'd buy a house, I'd buy a unit, I'd, I'd buy land. You, you would buy an outcome. That's your your what. Have I understood you right? Yeah, I mean, why do we invest? We invest because we want an outcome. What outcome do we want? Do we want growth? Do we want income? Do we want short-term, long-term? How much risk are we willing to take? All these questions need to be decided before you start looking for an asset, in my opinion. Because the right asset for you is not what someone else says is a good asset. The right asset for you is a property that will make you in the, mo the most money in the quickest time for the least risk and the lowest aggravation. I say over and over and over again until I lose all my hair <laughs> that you've got to let the output determine the input. 
don't let the input determine the output. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? Because I feel like you've really hit something interesting there. Yeah, well, you go to a real estate agent and say, this property you've got for sale, will this make a good investment? What do you think they're going to say? Yes. Hell yeah, it's going to make a great investment. Yeah. <laughs> you should buy it. Yeah. Go figure, <laughs> right? And so the question is, it might make a great investment for someone, but will it make a great investment for you? And in order to answer that question, you can't just say that all houses in suburb X are good investments. You've got to look for the house in suburb X that best meets your needs. How do you know what your needs are unless you've sat down and determined what they are before you buy? Interesting. Okay. So as far as the the why is concerned, so not the why, uh, what is the the first one? We're looking at where next up. How does where come into this? Let's say someone has sat down and gone, okay, I know what I need. I'm looking for X, Y, Z factors in a property. How do you start determining the where? Okay. In order to answer this question for you, Todd, we need to go back to some Steve McKnight investing theory. Do you want to do that? If we've got time, yeah, sure. So there's three points in time. There's now, mm -hmm. and then there's before now, and then there's after now, which we'll call then. The question you want to answer is, how do I use real estate so that my then is what I want it to be relative to where I am now? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. First thing you need to do is set a then. What are you trying to work towards? After you've set a then, then you link it to compelling reasons why then is a priority for you. Because if it's not a priority, you're probably going to say it's a dream, but whether or not you get it into a reality will be determined. So you've got a then, next you've got a why or a compelling reason why you want to achieve your then. Mm -hmm. After you've got a then and a why, mm -hmm. you then go into a when. When am I going to do something about this? What action do I need to take today to prepare for tomorrow? After the when is which is the point you start talking about what and where, what do I buy, where do I buy it? And then even more importantly, how, what investing strategy am I going to pursue in order to achieve my goal? So I feel like um, having an episode, which is what, where, why has missed the then, when, and uh, no, the then, the why and the when beforehand. We've got a little bit. Exactly. Backwards. You've missed the three most important things that every investor should answer to concentrate on the three things that everyone wants to know about how do I run and buy a good property without having the context for what makes the property good. Okay, so it's not that there's not a right where, it's that the right where for one person could be the wrong where for another person. And unless the why and the when has been determined after the then, the where <laughs> is irrelevant. Am I following you, Steve? So I think people might have to listen to this a few times to get all the what's and the where's and the when's and the why's figured out. The point of it is this, there's always property that can make money so long as people live in houses, right? Every suburb has an opportunity to make money. The question is, is that opportunity the one that's right for you? And the only way to answer that question, I think, Todd, is to look at the context for your investing first, because one person's property is another person's liability. One mm -hmm. person's asset is another person's liability. And hence, what's the difference? Well, it all depends on the investor. I feel like if I ask you why now, we're just going to to reiterate exactly what you've just said, because this, this has had a lot of why sprinkled into it. But are there any other final words of wisdom, Steve, that you'd like to leave our viewers with before we um, part ways today, mate? It's really easy to want to go and know where's the best suburb for me to invest in? What's the best house for me to buy? But the problem is that it changes over time. And it's the difference between someone giving you a fish and learning to fish for yourself. The art of investing isn't what happens where you buy or what you buy. The art of investing happens after you've bought up until the time you sell. It's the problems that you solve to add money and add value in the investment that will put money in your pocket. Remember, houses depreciate in value. So if houses depreciate and go down in value mm. through use, how do you make money out of real estate? The only way anyone can ever make money out of real estate is to pay you to use your property or to pay more than you did when it comes to selling your property. Understanding how to get someone to pay you to use your property or buy the property from you is the art of investing. Steve McKnight, you always make me think more every time I talk to you, mate. Thank you so much for jumping on the show and we hope to have you back on it again soon. Bye. I knew Steve was going to like bring something different to the table, but I, I wasn't quite expecting that. But if you're listening to this right now thinking, hold on a second, where, where am I buying? 
don't worry, you're probably supposed to feel a little bit confused. But this was one of the reasons I kind of wanted Steve on the panel, because I think that as far as like, what are you going to buy? Where are you going to buy it? Why are you going to buy it? It is incredibly important. Unless you strip it back to the why, you might be buying something that is like the perfect investment, but is it the perfect investment for you? And like looking back, like what was it? I'm looking at my notes down there. Now, before now, then, why, uh, when, what, where, like... Things started to get a little bit confusing. So if you weren't following, don't feel silly. I get a little bit lost as well. But the thing that I wasn't lost on is exactly Steve's importance of of finding out what's actually the right property for you. What's the right method for you? What's the right strategy for you? You need to align this with your goals. Like is what Maddie Sharma said, the right investment for you. Getting a little two bedroom unit, something that maybe you can add some value to close to the sand. Or maybe going regional, like Lachlan said is the, the right one for you. Or maybe we're about to talk with Kate Bakos. An amazing property investor. This woman is incredibly accomplished, been a buyer's agent for such a long time. Why don't we find out exactly what she'd buy, where she'd buy it, and why she'd buy it for a budget of 700000 But whatever said, I want you to keep what Steve said in mind about really analyzing if it fits your goals. But right now, let's talk to Kate Bakos from Kate Bakos Property. Kate Bakos, how you going? I'm well, thanks. Good to see you again. You too. I think you uh, just said last time off air, last time we saw each other was 6am in a Japanese hotel room, which <laughs> it sounded sounds, terrible, didn't it? <laughs> it could be taken way out of context, but I, I love that you're so dedicated to, to getting the message out and helping property investors that you would actually get up that early on your holiday. But now you're, yeah. you're back, you're at work and we're about to find out your, what would you buy? Where would you buy it? And why would you buy it? Did you want to jump straight into it? Yeah, sure do. Awesome. Well, 700k is the maximum budget. For starters, what would you buy? Well, to start, I would buy a house on full land mm. in an established area, and I wouldn't want to get a brand new house on on a small block of land. I'd like a traditional normal block, so that might be, you know, 600 square metres to maybe 720 square metres. Okay, 600 to 720. And then when you say a full house as well, you, you're talking mm. what, uh, a maximum, sorry, a minimum sort of dwelling size of what, 130, 150? How big are we going? Yeah, look, a three bed, maybe two living area, maybe even a four bedroom home. You can get them. Uh, something that will take a large family and ideally be near schools and shops. And the, the clincher for me is near rail. I want it to be within easy walking distance or, or a short bus trip. All right. Well, I feel like we've transitioned perfectly into the the where then. So as far as its proximity mm. from within the suburb, near rail is a must for you. But where whereabouts yeah. are we talking? Well, I'm going to shine a spotlight on Laylaw, which is in the north of Melbourne, northern suburb. And yep. if you head up the train line that goes through Northcote, Thornbury, Preston Reservoir, for all you Melbournians out there who know this particular location, it's been very popular. And if you go above Reservoir, and Reservoir is a very big suburb, it has three train stations, but at the top of Reservoir, you'll hit the Ring Road. Mm -hmm. And then when you cruise over the Ring Road, you're into Thomastown. And then the next suburb, which is very similar to Thomastown, is Laylor. So you're only 16, 17 kilometres from the CBD, and you can jump on a train and be into the city in, in a normal commute time, you're not sitting on a, on a train for an hour. It's less than 40 minutes. Yeah, right. All right. So as far as dollars and cents are concerned, if we're looking at a full house, 600 to 700 square meter block, that kind of size, what are we talking? Have we spent the whole 700K budget or is there some change? Yeah, indeed. We have? Yeah, we've okay. spent it all. And it, it won't be a freshly renovated house, but it will be well presented. It will be ready to rent and and if it's not there'll only be a few little things to do that might be catching up with some of our rental regime changes but you'll get yourself a dated 70s or 80s house on a big block have a garage it might even have a lock shed at the back and you can live in it or, or pop a tenant in there straight away so in terms of uh, kilometers how, how far are we talking from melbourne cbd to Laylor, roughly yeah 16 to 17 kilometers it's it's quite a short trip when you contrast it to some of the locations that you'll spot in the east where you'll get a similar product. Yeah. There's a lot of value for money to be had here. And there are a few reasons why I love Laylaw beyond just the value for money and, and the amenity. Mm -hmm. If you have a look at the suburbs surrounding it, you've got it's it's landlocked by established areas. So it's not a fringe area with green fields beside it and brand new housing undermining it. You've got uh, Epping above it. Epping Plaza is huge and it, it attracts a crowd when they want to go shopping. You've also got the Northern Hospital. So as you can imagine, you'll have a lot of tenants that are you know nursing staff and medical staff in this particular area. 
and the ring ride gives you a lot of amenity but you can keep on going with your urban sprawl well north of, of these areas but what's really interesting is if you have a having a look at epping and south Morang, which are to the north of it mm -hmm. their price points are higher and when you look just below it in reservoir the price points are higher so we'll get that that natural ripple effect that will continue to put Layla and Thomastown on the map even more so, I believe. And are you looking at this as a, a real long-term, like holding for 10, 20 years play, or do you suspect that this is going to be something that will, will nudge up in the next kind of 12, 24 months? Do you know what? I don't like speculating and saying short-term growth is something that I can forecast, but if I was going to, you know, hang my hat on, on that particular claim, I would think that this particular suburb will give you a good crack at that certainly in the next three four five years it has been performing for the last five years mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of run left in it and and there are some really compelling reasons why it's becoming more of a draw card for first home buyers and people wanting a family sized home so I would I would always say to an investor my, my game plan is buy and hold you know that everyone knows that and I don't like buying an investment if the horizon is less than five years and ideally 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. But I think in this particular case, if I had a five-year plan, I'd certainly have a look at Laymore. And last quick question, as far as yields are concerned, where, where would we be roughly yeah. sitting? Well, the yields have got a lot better because yields are better everywhere, really. And Melbourne houses have, have been playing catch up. But traditionally for a house like this, you would have been looking at 360 to 380 a week. But we're now achieving 420, 440, which is in line with the rental growth that we've had. So you might just get 3% if the internal refurb is pretty good. But mm -hmm. a gross rental yield of 2.8, 2.9 is, is pretty much a given in this location. Beautiful. Kate Bakos from Kate Bakos Property. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Always appreciate your time. Always a pleasure. Good to see you.